Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jens, for the kind introduction, and I also want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me here to this very nice place. Uh, as already mentioned, I want to talk about the detection of non-trivial surface states uh, by our STM, and I'll uh, concentrate on two materials. The first one is a condo insulator, meaning a strong correlated material, so my max are borite. And the second, uh, I should say, class of material is a half law uh, are the half law compounds uh, yttrium palladium bismuth and yttrium platinum bismuth. Um, but before I actually get into physics, I would like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators. Uh, this is a talk about STM, so these are the most important people here. Lin Zhao, now in Tallahassee, Vicky still with me, and uh, Jean Sousa, now at the Weizmann Institute. The samples came either from Los Alamos, uh, Sack Fisk earlier, and nowadays uh, Priscilla Rosa, and uh, the ytrium based uh, half Häusler compounds came from uh, Campinas, and I also appreciate the lots of discussions I have and, of course, the funding. Now, to get started... Ooh. Okay, uh, a, a quick reminder. Uh, scanning tunneling microscopy is not only very good in uh, looking at surfaces and uh, seeing how the topography looks like here now, this is niobium diselenide, and you see the charge density wave. But uh, actually, we can now go for a predefined uh, position and do spectroscopy, so very local spectroscopy. And the point I want to make here is uh, that the, the, the IDV curves I'm going to show are uh, proportional to the local density of states, and we can get information, direct information, about the one particle Green's functions. And that was very nicely alluded to already yesterday, for instance, in uh, Professor Wiesendanger's talk. Now, let me, uh, this is the instrument. Uh, we are uh, mostly using uh, a UHV uh, scanning tunneling microscope, uh, base temperatures 0.3 Kelvin, and we have a 12 Tesla magnet uh, inside. Uh, this is coming with a little bit of a delay here. I have to get used to it. Now let's get started by looking at some IM hexaborite. Uh, STM is a very surface sensitive probe. That means we need to have clean surfaces. So what we typically do is first going into UHV and secondly, we cleave the samples. But then we have to ask ourselves, so what about the surface? Here in case of samarium hexaborite, it's a cubic structure. So we don't have a preferred cleaving plane. And on top of that, uh, the samarium, uh, the, the valence of the Raho, it doesn't have to be samarium, is between two and three. So we end up with polar surfaces if we cleave along one of the main crystallographic axes. And polar surfaces are known to be prone to surface reconstructions. So, and in consequence of that, this is what we mostly see. These topographies are not atomically flat. And I should emphasize here, this is the vast majority of the surface areas we look at. So this is certainly not uh, what we are aiming for. You could imagine that the individual atoms here have different environments, and it's certainly not, or it's not necessarily related to the semiam hexaboride that we are interested in. And that should be kept in mind, because if you look at, uh, into ARPES or something like that, you know, you always average over certain areas. Yeah? Here with our SDM, we can concentrate on smaller areas, and then uh, with some luck, you get actually nice areas like this one. These two here are samarium terminated surfaces. The ones here on the right hand side are boron terminated surfaces, and, that, and that's what we basically need and what we are going to focus on in the uh, next uh, minutes. Uh, but I should mention again, these patches are only something like 60, 70 nanometers in size, if at all. Uh, what could be a little bit larger is actually these reconstructed surfaces here. Think of that uh, uh, here in this case, each second row of samariums taken away. So you end up with a two by one reconstructed surface. They can, they can be a little bit larger, up to a micron or so. Uh, but they don't need to be straight lines here. They can also meander around, but it takes care of the uh, polar surface issue. Okay, now if we go for the nice areas like shown here, uh, then you can do spectroscopy in, in a clean region, and you immediately see there's a lot of things going on, yeah, specifically at these low temperatures. You need to go below something like uh, three, two to three Kelvin in order to see that. And then you can relate that to the band structure, and it's clear that here in this case we have multiple bands involved. And uh, the first thing that we 
fingers going on is that we see the onset of the hybridization gap in the order of 20 milli electron volts in line with other measurements. Uh, then we have the small peak here. Uh, it's a very small one, so we think it's related to the gamma A2 uh, band here that's very flat, but hybridizes only very little, so you can, we can only, we, we have very little access to it. Uh, the matrix elements are probably pretty small. Uh, but most importantly, we have this peak here at uh, minus 6.5 milli electron volts, and uh, that's what I'm going to focus on in, in the next couple of minutes, and I'll show it. It's, it has some bike contributions, as shown by other measurements, but mostly it's, uh, it has surface contributions, and that's what I'm going to focus on in the following. Now, the issue here is actually that, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion, and most people nowadays believe that the Maya Maxaborat is a topological uh, insulator, uh, but it's actually pretty difficult to show because of the small energy scales involved here. It's only a few milli electron volt you need to resolve. So ARPES is pretty much at the limit. Uh, and uh, also uh, there are controversial results, uh, for instance, from ARPES, but also from other measurements. So what we thought of doing is, uh, what about the surface? We are very surface sensitive. So maybe uh, if we talk about top topology, we can make use of the time reversal symmetry breaking in case of magnetic impurities. That shouldn't be there if we, for comparison, also put non-magnetic impurities in. So that's uh, what we set out doing, and actually the um, uh, hexaboride structure is here very flexible and helpful in a sense that we can put almost any raw earth and also other elements here on, on this side. So what we set out doing is, on top of also looking at the pure semium hexaboride, to look at the gadolinium doped ones and the yttrium doped ones, so we have a magnetic and a non-magnetic impurity, so to speak. These are the surfaces we uh, are going to investigate in the following. So on the left-hand side, I have pure samarium with a defect here. This is a 3% yttrium doped sample and a 0.5% uh, gadoliniums doped sample. And uh, I would argue that this here are gadoliniums, these here are yttriums, and we can speculate about this defect uh, if you wish to. But if we now do spectroscopy, the, uh, then if you are far away from the defect here on the clean area, then you see the spectroscopy I have just shown before, and that's actually common to all of these uh, samples here, independent of what we dope with. Uh, so here, if you are away, the same structure, but then if you approach the, the defect, you see that here, the, the, um, actually the apex of this peak is a little bit chopped off. In contrast, if you look at the gadolinium uh, here, you see this peak here, if you are right at this defect, it's almost completely gone. Yeah? In order to be a little bit more quantitative here, what we did is we looked at the height, simply the height of this peak, and we compared this, or we showed that here, independence on the distance from the defect. So the defect is here located at zero. And as you can see here, uh, uh, at about 1.5 nanometers away from the distance, we have the clean surface, so everything has recovered. But then if we go towards the uh, uh, impurity here, we uh, reduce the peak height by about 25%. That's different on the gadolinium. Here, if we are away from the defect, again, we have the clean surface, but we go down here if we approach the uh, impurity by about 75%. So that's much, uh, much stronger a reduction, and also uh, it's over a larger extent uh, to, of about 2.2 nanometers. I'll come back to that in a second. So clearly, this peak here at minus 6.5, and also the one I haven't alluded to so far, the minus 2.5, is mostly due to uh, surface contribution. So we looked around in the literature whether there's any theory that can account for that. And indeed, there is. And the main ingredients here are, uh, are basically an exchange interaction between the local magnetic moment and the uh, surface state electrons here. Uh, also, the Fermi velocity uh, uh, comes into play here, and of course, the suppression lengths, which we get here, or the healing lengths, as uh, Zach Fisch dubbed it. So, uh, we got actually got in touch with uh, Xiao Xing Liu from Penn State University, and he helped us very nicely with doing here a, a model calculation, and you see it fits our data pretty nicely. So, what we get is an exchange energy, energy of about 1.4 milli electron volts and a Fermi velocity of about 3,000 meters per second. Most importantly, 
you see we now get a nice fit, and that's where we get the suppression lengths from. So in case of a magnetic impurity, we get 2.2 nanometers. In case of a non-magnetic impurity, yttrium, or a, a, a defect in the pure samarium hexaboride, we get about 1.5 nanometers. So clearly, the uh, surface state is suppressed over a larger extent uh, in case of the magnetic impurity. And we can compare that actually to other results. So there, is, uh, there are nice uh, measurements by Jenny Hoffman's group here on the uh, two by one reconstructed surface. And what they get from quasi particle interference image on the surface is the uh, location of the Dirac cone, which is at about minus five milli electron volts. So that's very nice because with minus five, if we have the additional exchange energy to overcome, we end up with the peak at uh, minus 6.5 uh, milli uh, volts. Uh, also, uh, our 3,000 meters per second for the Fermi velocity is basically uh, in between the two uh, uh, velocities she gave for, uh, in her paper for the two different directions. So that fits very nicely. One question remains open. Uh, what actually, why do we actually see uh, a suppression in the a case of the non-magnetic impurities at all? Now, uh, here you have to think about uh, that what we are starting with is a condo insulator. So we have samarium hexaboride. And only if we have samarium on each lattice side, we can make up or build up this condo insulating properties. If we now take away samarium, we basically create what's known as a condo hole. And uh, that's then, that can also be magnetic. Uh, and that, we think, is the origin why we also see something in case of non-magnetic impurities. But as you can see, it's less pronounced. Now, in order to come up with a picture on, on what's actually going on, I have here this little cartoon we now basically look at the surface of the sample and we have suppressed the surface states here uh, around the uh, magnetic impurities. Now, in this case, if we have only a very small number of impurities, you can still have a percolating pa a path here and you still have uh, 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 this plateau here, which is a hall in the plateau in the resistivity at low temperature, which is a hallmark of the surface states uh, in this material. But now, of course, if you increase the number of defects, at some point, you prevent percolation. Yeah? And in case of gadolinium, that already happens at 3% gadolinium doping. You see here, the uh, plateau here at low temperature is suppressed, yeah? or is no longer visible. Yeah? It just goes up. There may be something left over here, but uh, the, the, the surface conductivity, we think, is no longer percolating. For the non-magnetic case, we now, because it's smaller in extent, we need more of substitution. So we would actually need something like 12 to 13 percent. That's our estimate. The sample we had to our avail was 18 percent. And you see clearly there is no plateau here. But now you see already a problem. I mean, 3 percent or 80 percent, this is not a small impurity number. Yeah? So if we do such large uh, uh, substitutions, you run into the question, well, what do we actually do to the sample in, uh, from point of view of inhomogeneity or the condo effect? And are we actually really certain? We are looking at the gadolinium, for instance. So we thought about this and thought, OK, the only ingredients we need here is the exchange interaction. So, so why do we actually need to put the magnetic impurity into the sample? We could also have it on the tip. Yeah? So we set out and, and did uh, STM with a chromium tip, chromium coated tip, and here's the result. You now see for the tungsten tip, the red, that's what you have seen before. Now for the chromium tip here, it's completely suppressed. There, there may, might be a little bit of a leftover. We think that's the bike contribution. Uh, but the most, for the most part, this peak is suppressed. And it's not a matter of some stray field or something. I mean, you wouldn't expect anything from a chromium uh, antiferromagnet. But nonetheless, just for cross-check, I show here a tungsten tip result uh, in applied 12 Tesla. And you see a 12 Tesla field doesn't do much to the spectrum. It's here offset for clarity. Uh, it really takes the exchange energy, energy to suppress the surface states. Now, if you listen carefully, I mentioned in the beginning it's actually pretty difficult to find clean spots. So now here you could ask the question, in order to do that comparison, I have to take the tungsten tip out and replace it by chromium. So who tells me that I'm actually at the very same position? Do I actually compare different positions here? That's a question we cannot really truly answer. 
Uh, but what came to our help is the following observation. Now, go back, we go back to the gadolinium doped sample here, 0.5% gadolinium doped, and to the regular tungsten tip. So what we see with a newly introduced sample, newly cleaved sample, is the normal spectrum I have now shown several times. But then, if we scan, it happens every once in a while that we pick up something from the surface, and we see that by a step in the topography. And uh, then the, the uh, spectra here is changed heavily. And it's now similar to what we have seen on the gadolinium substituted before, and also uh, uh, to uh, the chromium tip. Now, this only happens on the gadolinium doped samples, but we have one more uh, parameter to play with uh, to make my argument complete here. We can actually get rid of the add atom by applying a, a pulse to the tip, a 10 volt pulse, and if you remove the added uh, atom here, you basically recover the original uh, spectrum. So that's, uh, I think, very nice proof that it really was uh, due to the add atom and very likely a magnetic atom gadolinium. We have never seen that on a samarium or on a, on a pure samarium or on a yttrium doped sample. Now, we also tried to play a little bit with the, with the samples itself. So, for instance, we tried to grow, or actually Priscilla tried to grow uh, samarium deficit samples. But this is a flux growth method. And in contrast to the floating zone growth, they, the samples always grow, like to grow at the one to six uh, uh, composition. So as you can see here for the nominally 0.75 boron six, there's no defect at all to be seen. So basically what we learned from this, this phase is very, very stable. So any approach here didn't, didn't help us. We also tried to manipulate the surface a little bit with our focused ion beam. And here you see we increased the number of cuts. We simply cut the uh, surface to interrupt this, the, the surface state. And as you can see here in the, in the uh, sample surface with the most cuts, here we have a distance between the cuts of about 10 to 15 micrometers. You still see that the resistivity, that's the sample called F9, uh, plateau is developing. So the surface states are still there. They are now meandering through the cuts, uh, but, uh, and uh, also we have increased scattering, of course, but it's, uh, the, the plateau still develops, meaning that if we cut trenches, the, the surface states just follow the newly developed surface area. Okay. So much for the samarium hexaboride. I now want to switch over to the other compound I want to report on, which is a half Häusler compound. And uh, if you start here from the uh, normal regular Häusler compound and you take uh, away half of these red atoms here, then you end up with the half Häuslers. Yeah? You could replace that by uh, another species here, for instance, the blue ones, and then you end up with the what's called inverse Häusler alloys. So this is a very versatile family of compounds. There are more than a thousand compounds of the Häuslers uh, known. It's a cubic structure, so we can put quite a variety of elements uh, on all of the three sides, and that means we can play with the properties. Depending on what we put in, we can either have magnetism or play with the spin-to-orbit coupling, or that's why I showed this example, even play with the symmetry. What I want to focus on here is actually the interplay of uh, spin-orbit coupling with topology. Now, uh, what I will focus on is ytopium uh, palladium bismuth, ytopium platinum bismuth, because they have almost identical lattice constants. Yeah? Uh, that doesn't there's not much happening if you replace palladium versus platinum, yeah? And you see that here where in this plot where we have the lattice constants in the pan or, or and here on the vertical axis, the uh, gamma six, the location of the gamma six uh, band with respect to the gamma eight band, I'll come back to that in a second. Here they are almost at the very same lattice constant. So why do we plot this particular type of energy here? It tells you about the band inversion. If the gamma six is above the uh, gamma eight states, then you have a trivial insulator. So the S type is just above the P type. But if it's the other way around, you have a band inversion. Yeah? And that was theoretically predicted already uh, more than 10 years ago. So um, again, as I mentioned, this is a cubic structure. So again, we had a difficulty of cleaving. And uh, we, it took us quite some time until we actually got some nice surfaces. Oh, wrong direction. Uh, but 
then uh, after some time we actually found a very nice surface here. You see a triangular lattice of the corrugations and that immediately tells you we are looking at a one, one, one surface. Yeah? Otherwise it wouldn't make sense. Um, the uh, uh, distance between the corrugations matches nicely with what we expect from uh, XRD or any, basically from the uh, lattice itself. So uh, we expect uh, 4.69 uh, uh, angstrom and we get 4.6 uh, from our STM, so that's very nice. And also if we look at uh, steps um, that we see here, we get typically something which is in the order a little bit less than of a little bit less than 400 picometers, and that's basically here the, the lattice, uh, half of the lattice constant. Uh, but every once in a while we also see steps of about 100 nanometers, and then we clearly know, know that the uh, palladium, uh, or in this case the platinum, is involved here, yeah? because uh, it's, this line is missing here because it's a half hoistler along this direction, uh, it's missing. Uh, what we see is, uh, independent of what surface we are looking at, the spectra look very much alike, they look V-shaped, but we have a very uh, finite density of states, so it doesn't, it's not an insulator, yeah, in this case, uh, at least not at the surface. Now, the bad or negative surprise came when we looked at the palladium. We, despite heavy searching, and we spent more than two months on that, and several samples were cleaved, we did not see any decent uh, cleave on a 111 surface. Uh, but I should stress here, in order to compare the two compounds, of course, we need to cleave along the same direction. They need to be crystallographically identical. Otherwise, we would compare apple with pears or whatever. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be a fair comparison. So, okay, we went back to the palladium, uh, to the plate, platinum, and the second best topography we found is shown here. You see, it's not quite as nice as the 111 directions, but we do see a regular arrangement of the corrugations with this uh, distance is shown here. Uh, they come from a uh, Fourier transform, but you can also get it directly from uh, uh, zoom into these uh, ni into nicer areas. And we also get step edges in the height, uh, with a height of a bit more than 100 picometers. And uh, actually, if we go for an area like this where we have quite an assembly of step edges, we get something in the order of uh, average of 125 uh, picometers approximately. So now we also know, because whenever we put our samples into the SDM, we do allow it beforehand in order to note the orientation. So in this case, we know we have a 001 surface attached to the sample holder. And uh, while scanning, we notice that uh, the, the surface is actually inclined by about 30 degrees. So this gives us a, a good hint of what surface we are actually look at. And we think it's the 012 uh, terminating plane in this case because in this case you expect something like 29 degrees for the, for the surface uh, 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 inclination. And also if you look at the distances between, thank you very much, between the uh, uh, corrugations, uh, then it becomes clear we very likely don't have uh, platinum here. It seems to be that we have a bismuth yttrium terminated surface plane and that's also be seen by others, for instance, by ARPES measurements and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, we seem to have a two by one reconstructed surface. Now, just for comparison now, uh, for the uh, palladium, in this case, we were lucky. We also found uh, uh, atomically flat surfaces, as shown here, similar uh, distances between the corrugations, and again, distilled of about 30 degrees. So far, we haven't seen any step edges, so this part of the comparison is missing, but still, I think uh, we do uh, have sufficient evidence that this is a uh, 012 surface, and um, well, again, with the two by one uh, reconstruction. Uh, the reconstruction is actually, in this case, not a bad thing because uh, we expect uh, dangling bonds here, and with the reconstruction, we minimize the number of dangling bonds so we avoid trivial surface states. Now, if we if we look at the spectroscopy and we compare different areas and also uh, the, the uh, average over the whole area shown here, we do see large, a large difference between the two samples. In case of the platinum, as for the 111 surface, we see a finite density of states, again here the V-shaped uh, uh, spectrum, but in case of the palladium, you see a clear gap here. Yeah? 
So there's clear-cut difference here. Now, of course, that calls for band structure calculations. And indeed, if you look back into literature, there are a number of band structure calculations already done, but they mostly focus on comparison to ARPAS. So far, we haven't found any STM rep report on these uh, half hausler compounds. So, uh, and what we need here is actually uh, the, very much the surface states. So that's why we uh, got in touch with Andres here. Uh, 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 from Krakow, and he did, uh, first of all, DFD calculations and compared with the literature and found a nice agreement. But on top of that, he also calculated surface screen functions by using uh, one tools, and that's actually what we need and what we can compare to now to our STM results. So let's first have a look here at the platinum-based compound. You see here right above the Fermi level, we have a direct bone, uh, point here, and we have these surface state bands, or sur yeah, surface bands here, uh, very close to the surface. And we think this is the reason why we see here a finite density of states in case of the platinum. As you can see, for comparison here in the palladium-based compound, uh, there is no such thing here, no direct point, visible, nothing, and uh, in agreement with that, we do see the gap. Uh, we would like to have density of states, and he's working on that, he promised, so uh, uh, that's as much as we have right now for the comparison, but what we can compare to also is uh, the bulk properties, yeah? and it's known uh, Yes, I'll, that's the last slide, actually. Uh, we, um, if we look at the Sommerfeld coefficients, uh, they are very small, but comparably small for both the compounds. And that tells us, in the bulk, we have a very small uh, uh, local uh, and very low local density of states near the, near the Fermi level. Yeah? And the same result comes from the uh, density of states. So that increased density of states here cannot be explained by bulk states. Yeah? So very likely that comes from the uh, band inversion uh, in case of the platinum, and uh, uh, very likely uh, this is due to the non-trivial topology and not from the surface reconstruction, which has not been taken into account into the calculation so far. And that brings me to my summary. Uh, I hope I've shown you that we have uh, indications for surface states in the domain hexaborides, which are suppressed by uh, magnetic impurities more heavily than non-magnetic impurities. And the same also happens for uh, magnetic tips. If we use magnetic tips, so very likely we have an exchange driven magnetism. Uh, mechanism, sorry. Uh, for the half loss compounds, we could identify the 1, 2, 0 surface in both compounds and compare the density of states and they are in agreement with a surface band structure calculations. I actually intended to show a third materials where we, uh, this is hafnium silicon sulfide, where we see very nice uh, quantum uh, Landau quantizations, but in the interest of time, uh, I skipped that. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Steffen, for this very interesting talk. Um, other questions? Thank you for an interesting talk. <clears throat> Concerning the suppression of the surface states around the impurities that you looked at, the magnetic impurities, is this visible for both negative and positive voltages? Uh, wait a second. We do it? No. Um, we concentrate on the peak for which we've, and that's at minus 6.5 milli electron volts, which we think carries the most of the surface contribution of the states. That's where we think the states are basically located. So we sit at this very energy. Yeah? If we go away, we don't see much of differences. Yeah? That's, that's, the, uh, that's why I made in my introduction uh, this the assignment of the peaks. Yeah? We think this is very much where the surface states are located. So we have to be at this very energy. There is a side peak, which I haven't uh, really alluded to at minus 2.5, but it's not as well developed and it's actually on the rising side of the bigger peak, so it's difficult to analyze with much larger error bars. Uh, maybe you noticed that there were always two uh, markers. Uh, they coincide, but I would put the emphasis on the minus 6.5. Yeah? That's where the states are located, we think. 
Okay. Uh, a second question: Is it purely isotropic? These, these these suppressions that you see, or they contain some uh, spatial structure? Well, I cannot rule out spatial structure. We haven't seen anything, but you know, we are always happy when we see uh, some nice areas. Yeah. And then if you go uh, away in a certain direction, it takes some time. And after a couple of days, let's say three days, I have to refill liquid helium. And we need to retract the tip. If we go down again, we cannot be certain that we are at the very same position. So it's very difficult for us, or we haven't done so far, let's say from one uh, impurity, go into different directions. We, we went, let's say, uh, cross-like, that I can rule out, uh, but you know we haven't done any, let's say, 45 degrees or so. Okay. This I cannot rule out, I cannot answer. We but simply weren't able to do so. Okay, won't uh, you see that in voltage-dependent imaging? Um. Uh, we haven't seen anything, but that doesn't have to, I mean, I, I don't trust that too much. Uh, I, I would love to go, uh, you know, like this, but, uh, yeah. well. Maybe but we, kind of, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I think we have to move on. Um, maybe you should um, continue the discussion during the break because we are a little bit in lack of time. Oh. Thanks, uh, Steffen Wirt again for this beautiful talk. Okay.